The following program is a special presentation of Lax Sports Network. Denver has taken control. Ohio's on the ropes in this heavyweight bout rematch of last year's title game. They say everything is bigger in Texas. That includes potential heartbreak. The 2017 MLL Championship game was held at the Star in Frisco. The Ohio Machine trailed the Denver Outlaws in the third quarter. Feeds Bergson, scores! Quick stick, goal, what a connection! And Denver is on a major roll. Outlaws lead 10-6. It is all Denver in the second half. Things got a little dicey there when it became 10-6, and guys were kind of starting to yell at each other. Things were kind of falling apart. But any sense of doom was quickly replaced by a sense of urgency. Do you guys feel sorry for yourselves right now? Like, we've been here before. Like, why are we acting like this? This is not the team that we have built. All the guys have been there. We've been through a whole season. We know what it took. Don't feel sorry for yourselves. We're right in this thing, and stay positive. We're going to be fine. Find a way. Find a way was our thing the entire year. Our underlying theme throughout the whole season was just find a way. Just find a way to make it happen. The successful construction of any machine typically follows a blueprint. An idea is formed, pieces are assembled, and manufacturing begins. The blueprint for the 2017 Ohio machine started four years earlier with the hiring of Kenneth Bear Davis as head coach. He took over a team that wasn't what fit his style, if you will, and they've, they allowed him to gradually put his imprint on this franchise. He had been successful at the college ranks in starting up a college program. All right, come in here, take a look at this, let's tear it down, let's build it back up. The 2013 machine team finished with a 2-12 and record. The Ohio machine lose to the Chesapeake Bayhawks by the final score of 11-7. to well, Just a, a gut-wrenching loss for the Ohio machine here tonight. Bear decided to bring the franchise out of hibernation. Especially myself getting into coaching and watching him coach, I think he's just the best trait about him is just his honesty and just his kind of cutthroat mentality. You know, if the guy's not playing well, he'll call him out or sub him for another guy the next game. Like, he doesn't beat around the bush. The process, you know, uh, is always just find a way to get better, you know, and I think that's been the theme since, you know, I, I got here at least in 2013 is you know, every day we come to work, we're gonna find a way to get better. 2014 delivered an eight win season and first playoff berth. The hottest team that'll be battling for this year's Steinfeld Cup resides in Delaware, Ohio. The following year saw a nine-win campaign. Time will expire. Ohio wins in dramatic fashion. And they will host a playoff game next Saturday. And finally, a playoff win and a spot in the 2016 MLL title game in Atlanta. For the first time in franchise history, the Ohio Machine are headed to the MLL Championship game. But that is where the championship construction encountered obstruction. Fakes in front, Law shoots, he scores! Eric Law scores for Denver with 12.9 to go in regulation. The Outlaws are 2016 Major League Lacrosse Champions. Definitely a, a devastating loss. Probably the toughest loss I've, I've ever had in my career other than my last college game. But, you know, I, I think, again, you know, it, 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 it tests you um, going through adversity like that. And to be so close, you know, we had a lot of guys who had been on the team, you know, years before, and we've kind of been going through the process of getting closer and closer, and then you kind of have it pretty much ripped away from you, you know, in the last, you know, few minutes of that game. Um, it was pretty tough, you know, for, for everyone to handle. That's tough. You know, it was a tough, that's a long off season. It's a real long off season. I know I never rewatched it. Um, I haven't thought about 
many plays in that game or reasons why we lost. What I took from it is we're a championship caliber team and that should be our expectations going forward. The championship loss would serve as motivation to the machine players entering the 2017 season, at least those that would be there. Midfielder Kyle Harrison was undergoing off-season ankle surgery that would shelve him for the first half of the year. My plan is to 100% be back on the field this season. My career is not over. Reigning league MVP Tom Schreiber would miss the first four games of 2017 due to other lacrosse commitments. And all-star attackman Steele Stanwick decided to take a year off from the sport. Steele told me even after our championship game that if, if we would have won, I, I felt pretty confident I, I probably would have retired, but he had made a decision to uh, not play this summer. Uh, we'll see where he sits, you know, in, in 18. Ohio would be looking to veterans such as Marcus Holman, Greg Piskolgin, Peter Baum, and all-star MVP Scotty Rogers to carry the load in 2017. Guys like Marcus, guys like Scotty, guys like Craig Skolge, and all these guys who have been there multiple years. Seeing them lose after that game um, was, was super upsetting and uh, knowing that they wanted to come back again and luckily enough all those guys ended up resigning. This is a team that had built itself, had gotten to the playoffs, had back-to-back -back opening round losses, get to the championship game and don't get the job done. To me the only goal for this machine team in 2017 was to get to the championship and then finish it off. You know, it was our, pretty much our entire motivation and we, you know, we looked at that game as like a whole season of making sure we wanted to finish things off, right? So finishing games off, finish the season off, I and mean, that was kind of you know, our mindset and our, our MO going into 2017. While the machine were ready to face the 2017 season, they would do so behind a group of faceless men. I think it started with that none of our core four defensemen, you know, Steve Waldeck, Matt McMahon, Jackson Place, Brian Carolunas were from in ACC or Big Ten school, right? You have Stony Brook, Bucknell, Penn, and uh, Villanova. You kind of think of the MLL, and you immediately think of guys from Virginia or Maryland or Hopkins, and three dudes from, from those schools. It's an interesting mix where I think they had an extra chip on their shoulder to prove something in the league. For the faceless men and their teammates, 2017 would begin right where 2016 ended, on a field at Kennesaw State University in Georgia right outside of Atlanta. I felt like it was real important to go into Atlanta, a place where we finished the championship game and lost, and we've never won there. We never beat Atlanta. We never won in Atlanta, uh, even in championship games. So really, uh, we're always looking for first times. You know, like, that, let's do this for the first time. Previous years, we never, you know, sometimes we get on the right foot and then we kind of have these lulls. So we wanted to make sure, especially being back kind of at the scene of the crime. You know, although we weren't playing Denver, a lot of guys, you know, still had those memories of, you know, being there for the championship game. So we just, we just wanted to come out, you know, and just win by any means necessary. The means that were necessary for this win included holding Atlanta to just nine goals and offensive contributions from unexpected sources. Oh, there's a great pass and a feed to Mike Rooney who split some defenders and found a seam. Guys like Mike Rooney, who I think maybe only played one or two games for us, I think he had three goals. A bunch of newer guys that hadn't played for us in the past, had big roles in that game. We had one starter, uh, two, two starters. Oh, actually one from the championship game. Yep, we had one starter from the championship game the year before going into that game with Peter Baum. Uh, so it was, it was a big deal to, to go down there and get that win and start the season off right. Sweet revenge here for Ohio, coming back where they lost in the championship game last year, so they wanted to get, get on track. Week two showcased the return of all-star attackman Marcus Holman. I think that one, you get, you get Marcus back not only as a big help on the offense, but in terms of the leadership of our team and the energy of our team. In a lot of ways, he's our pulse. Well, I remember flying in on a red eye, um, so I wasn't at practice the night before and just getting to walk through and just, just being so fired up to be there. And you remember being fired up and, and trying to, to put my best foot forward out there as a player and as a leader. Holman put his best foot and stick forward scoring a hat trick in a season debut. Marcus Holman here in his first game of the season. Has a nice feed in front and a goal. Holman wasn't alone providing the offensive firepower. Mark Cockerton was named MLL Offensive Player of the Week after a four goal, three assist performance. Holman with a nice feed inside and a shot and a goal. Mark Cockerton. To see Mark Cockerton step up in the way that he did. A guy who flies under the radar a bit with you know, some of the players we, we've had on our roster the last few years, and Mark has been incredible. Ohio's faceless men defense held the Hounds scoreless for 23 minutes. Yeah, we had some guys, you know, 
probably stepping outside of their role, you know, what we've asked them to do and doing, trying to do too much. And that's just really not the character of our team. And we addressed it at halftime. We said, you know, let's get back to, you know, just staying in your lane, doing your job. Our, our defense, we realized we had to kind of, you know, pick it up. We hadn't started off that game the way we wanted to, but, you know, we kind of made some adjustments at halftime and then kind of buckled down and gave our offense, you know, more possessions, which obviously led to more goals than, uh, than us winning that game. In the past, it's been about our offense. Um, and now this year, the entire year, our defense was a rock. And I think those first couple games, especially when we were out a few offensive players, the defense being able to step up like that allowed them to kind of gain confidence and emerge you know, as leaders of our team. Bear Davis likes to talk about firsts. Ohio's home opener was also the first game at Fortress Obets, the machine's new home stadium built specifically for lacrosse. It was awesome being here. Like, you know, we had moved around over five years. We're at Upper Ohio Wesleyan, we're at Ohio Dominican. So having a stadium that we could call our own, we're at our own locker room and things like that, it was pretty cool. So, you know, guys were jacked up about that. First and foremost, having our own stadium was, was a huge move by the organization. And seeing a, a crowd there in your own stadium at halftime going to our own locker room with our own nameplates, um, it just made the whole thing feel that much cooler. This game would provide another first, the first machine loss of the year against Rochester. Rochester's great. I mean, you know, I think that that team has, you know, they, they have phenomenal players throughout their roster. I think their coaching staff does uh, one of the best jobs in the league. And, and we played that game well enough to win it all the way up to the last couple minutes. And in this league, that's the deciding factor most of the time, is the last couple minutes. In the last minute of that game, had a chance to run the clock out, couldn't get it done. All of a sudden, the turnover, and you give it to one of the most dynamic players in the league. Jordan Wolf starts with it. Jackson plays all over him. Keeps possession and scores! He gets it past Rodgers to tie the game with only 11 seconds to go. Obviously, Jordan Wolf's a pretty good player. <laughs> so him scoring that goal is like, you know, we thought we had it, and he, you know, covered, you know, it's like 50 yards of field in two seconds to score. Yeah, here's the matchup I was talking about here. Feed out in front. Thompson catches, fires, scores. Game over. Rochester will win in overtime. Uh, so that, you know, that kind of sucked not being able to win that home opener for our fans. Another home game resulted in another loss as the Charlotte Hounds came into Obets and redeemed themselves with a 10 to 8 victory, thanks in part to domination at the faceoff X. And they were winning faceoffs. They were, it was make them take them that game, you know, and, and it was uncharacteristic of uh, Greg Pasquulian at that time. And, and since he's been on our team to lose that many faceoffs, so we had a couple things working against us in that game that, you know, again, we had to go back to uh, the drawing board and figure out, you know, how, how are we going to overcome some of this stuff. I think that, at least in my opinion, guys thought that just because we pissed the game away last week that we were like going to come out and play better and be hungrier and, um, you know, that wasn't necessarily the case. In an unexpected move, Bear Davis switched his goalie with five minutes left replacing all-star Scotty Rogers with backup Kyle Burnmore. Out in front, save made, still a battle. That'll be a reset of the shot clock. Now another quick shot here and a save. Backup goalie Kyle Burnmore coming in, making two huge saves. He's in relief of Rogers for the moment. And as you said, made two point blank saves. Scotty uh, Rogers got hit with a shot the, the previous night. He was in pain. You know, and I knew that he wasn't stepping to the ball like he would, would have liked to. And as a coach, it's your, your job, you know, well, not sometimes, it's always your job to, to make sure that you're putting your players in situations to be successful. And I didn't think we were at that time with Scotty. And I, quite honestly, Kyle, we knew he's great. I was always right on the sideline, ready to go. Raj got banged up throughout the game a little bit. Coaches felt like it was, it was needed for a change late in the game. I went in there, felt great, made a couple saves try to get the ball back down the offense. And I really felt in that second game they lost here at home, uh, finally had hit that point where maybe they're starting to look around a little bit. You know, who are we? Who's going to be our leader? The answer would come the following week with the return of two-time league MVP, Tom Schreiber. We know we're getting Tom back in the lineup with the game against Florida. That's a huge boost to us. Obviously, you know, we, we have the best player in the world, arguably joining our roster and, you know, taking attention away from other guys. If I had to pick the best player in the world, he's a step above everybody else. He's just an unbelievable player. Getting Schreiber back in the lineup, clearly you could see the difference between, you know, two games before when we, you know, maybe struggled a little bit on the offensive end, but then having 
you know, two-time MVP back on the field is obviously going to make your team better. First couple of things I remember was having a horrible practice Friday night and being afraid that I forgot how to play field lacrosse. I remember just kind of trying to go underneath and not switching my hands and, and not shooting the ball from inside eight yards and uh, wasn't at my most confident point going into the game from a personal level, but so excited to be back. Schreiber made his presence known immediately, dishing out five assists as the machine grounded the launch, 19-7. Schreiber on the dodge, shoved out of the play by McNeil. That was slick. I, I think that game was one of those moments for the staff to say, okay, you know, we're starting to get our pieces back here. We've, we've uh, kind of weathered this uh, first four games, and those guys that stepped in did phenomenal. You know, they did a great job. But, you know, this was where we said, all right, let's see, you know, let's see what we can do with our guys. And uh, the chemistry between, you know, Tommy and the rest of the team is, is crucial. Another crucial development was happening at the goalie position. Despite Scotty Rogers being available, Kyle Burnlore started in net for Ohio. Coach let me know only a few days after that previous game, so I had over a week to kind of sleep on it and get myself ready throughout the week. So come Friday practice, I knew I was, I was playing the next day. You know, Saturday morning walkthrough, got what I needed, and uh, come game time, I, I was ready to go and pretty fired up that I uh, got to be the starting goalie that night, and we came out firing. Kyle just to step right in and, and play really well again, you know, kind of reassured the coaching staff and to our team that, hey, you know, th this kid's for real. It's not just a sub in. This might be th the guy that we're going with for the rest of the season. So I'm sure it was a confidence boost for him getting that win at home. I try to not put that pressure on me, but it, certainly I want to play. I think everyone, if you're competitive, you want to be on the field. And I didn't want to lose the job. I don't want to be back on the bench. So I knew for my own sake and my own personal competitiveness that I, I wanted to play well and win and kind of win the job. When the move happened, I thought, first thing in my mind is, okay, well maybe Scotty's dinged up a little bit, they're gonna give Burnlore some run here and Scotty will come back. But Burnlore wins his first start, gets Defensive Player of the Week in MLL, gets the start the next week, and all of a sudden you're seeing a little bit of a change on that side of the field for the Ohio machine. Another change for Ohio was about to happen on the other side of the field. The 2017 MLL draft was moved to Memorial Day weekend. The machine moved as well, up to number five on the draft board. The Ohio machine select, Connor Canizero, Denver, attack. Once you know, we started seeing how the draft was going, we're like, and the Bayhawks had already offered us you know, some opportunities to move up to five, but we said, who, who we want, we'll get, you know, we'll, we'll get at eight or you know, seven. You know, we'll get at seven. We don't need to move down to five. Once Connor is left on the table at five, I'm like, hey, he's not making it. You know, he's not making it out of five or six. We made the move to get Connor, and I was really, really fired up just watching him develop as a player at Denver. Uh, and, and, you know, what I've heard from him, the, the type of player, the type of person that he is and the type of teammate that he is. And he just, you know, exceeded those expectations. He's a Tremendous kid, great friend, um, great worker. So um, it's no surprise the success that he had just based on his talent and his work ethic. I think our offensive guys are really pumped about it. You know, us guys in practice weren't too thrilled because we don't have to be guarding him. So, so that, you know, but I mean, it's a good nightmare to have when he's on, you know, your team and you're watching him, you know, run defenseman ragging. I know we traded up to get him, um, which I think was a very, very wise move from, from the coaching staff and from Coach Davis, just because he was, he was perfect. He was exactly what we needed on our offense. And once he came on board, we were really able to kind of click and, and fire on all cylinders. Before their new attackmen would join the team, the machine had to travel to Navy Marine Corps Stadium to take on the Bayhawks. The Chesapeake offense was held at bay by Kyle Burnmore. What a stop by Burnmore, another clean save. He's on fire. Oh, what a look from Lunas. Burnmore got a foot on him. 20 saves in his second career start. Kyle played out of his mind. I think he kind of found out he was starting that game last minute. So obviously like to find out information out last minute it could be pretty nerve wracking, but you know, he's you know played down in Maryland. So he had people at the game. So I think that kind of you know motivated him. It just lucked out that we were playing in Annapolis. So I got to just hang out in College Park for a few days and then head on down to Annapolis and you know, throughout that game, all my turf buddies trying to heckle me behind the net. I'm just trying to, you know, talk crap to me while I'm trying to make saves, which uh, kind of relaxed me throughout the game. You know, those guys, best friends and love those guys. So just seeing them behind me and it was just, the whole thing was pretty funny. Not everyone was amused. I remember after the game saying, we can be so much better. 
but we'd claw our way to, to victory a lot of the time, which I think built a lot of character for our team. For me personally, like my favorite venue to play in, I had you know over 20 family members come growing up in Baltimore, so I always get fired up for those games. And Tom said, you know, we maybe didn't play our best, but I thought we, as a team, we we were playing really well. Burnlore's 20 saves helped solidify Ohio's 18 to 11 win. They also solidified his spot as the number one goalie for the remainder of the season. With the goalie position, only one guy gets to be on the field, so at all times in the league, there's two goalies that dress who are a starting caliber goalie in the league, so um, Raj goes down, I go in, I play well. You know, Coach Asides, why would we go back? He had a good game. Despite being relegated to a backup role, Scotty Rogers never complained. Deflecting animosity turned out to be his biggest save of the year. I think he handled it, I mean, definitely better than I would have handled it, for sure. Uh, I mean, put his ego aside and, you know, doing what's better for the team. I mean, all the guys on the team respect Scotty. You know, he's one of our more vocal leaders, and, you know, all the guys love him. So we all knew that that's a tough situation to be in, to not have that starting role, you know, still being a captain. But I think he handled it great. Never once, though, I doubt the fact that Scotty Rogers is a starting goalie in this league. And if we put him in, we expect starting goalie quality. And, and he knew that. Uh, but he also knows that Kyle is going to have a long, great career in this league. And if he could be a part of that journey for Kyle, he, he more than glad to help him. At the season midpoint, the machine were about to enter a three-game stretch that could define their season. First up, a home-and-home -home series against the Boston Cannons that saw the return of MLL legend Kyle Harrison to the Ohio lineup. I mean, it's Kyle Harrison. <laughs> so, so, I mean, you know, obviously it's in you, you're adding, you know, uh, a player of his caliber back to the lineup. It's always going to make you better. The name speaks for itself. You've you know, seen his highlights and things like that, you know, for the last 10, 10 years plus. Yeah, I think the AA came out and scored the first goal. Kyle Harrison, possession, it gets his first shot, and it goes in. Welcome back, Kyle Harrison. It got him a little confidence, got the guys fired up that he, he was back. The machine lost the lead late in the fourth quarter. That's when the attention shifted from an established legend to an emerging one. If anyone has questions about why Tom Shriver's the, the MVP of this league, you just can watch the, the final three minutes of that game. There's sometimes where he's very uh, uh, tactful in his thoughts, and then there's sometimes where he just goes out on the field and he's, I call it angry Tom, you know, where he just plays, you know, like a, a possessed man. I remember standing on the sideline and whoever was running off the field for us was running way faster than the offensive player for them to the sideline. I remember like seeing him like sprint like by everybody and I'm like, oh, Tom's wide open. And I knew I was gonna have a two or three step head start on him, so I just got ready to sprint. And at the time, like, I was like, oh, I can throw this pass. And I thought he had more space than he did. I've been playing lacrosse with Dominique Alexander since I was in sixth grade, so uh, I knew his head would be up and, and I knew if I sprinted, I could beat the guy trailing me out of the box, we'd have a small window. Schreiber in front scores! Oh. Tom Schreiber's come out of that box like out of a cannon. He's just firing behind that defense. You can see right there, just sprinting in. And those quick hands, that monster wrist finish right there, that's a huge play by this leader, by this captain. It's exactly what you needed. I didn't see where the ball went, but I heard the crowd, so I was pretty sure that we had scored and then uh, Dominique I think was the first one over to me on the grounds. Thank God you know he's Tom Schreiber and he <laughs> he made he made the play I just put the ball in the area he, he did all the rest of the work. Schreiber sent the game to overtime. Mark Cockerton ended it for Ohio. Schreiber feeds Cockerton fires scores ball game. I think we walked away from that game feeling that we stole that I don't I don't think we really played machine ball that game and after that I think there was a kick in the rear for us to start getting back to what we do. The next game followed the same blueprint. Another struggle at the face-off X. Another blown lead in the fourth quarter. Another game-winning goal in overtime against the Cannons. We drew up a play for Pete to go invert. And yeah, you know, I, I fade out the crease. Tom flashes through. I think the pass was going to me from Peter. I think he inverted. And I, I cut pretty hard. And I remember it being high. And I turn around to get back on defense. I look up and the ball's floating and just like lands right in my stick. It was fun because I'm pretty sure that feed, we all agree, was not to Marcus. 100% <laughs> was not to Marcus. Even Marcus said, I don't know, but I was ready for it. <laughs> if you watch the film, I literally look at the ball in my stick. I catch it, I'm like, oh my gosh, like just fired at the cage. It was kind of like, oh, look what I got my stick here and, and shoot, score a game. And, uh, it was fun. It was a fun victory. I was, you know, I was happy for the guys. Again, just defining that you know we're going to find a way to win games.
Connor Canizero scored a hat trick in his machine debut at Boston. He followed that with a more timely goal in a rematch with the Bayhawks. Holman, the feed, one more to Canizero who bats it into the back of the net. Keeping them in check for the most part was not easy that day, but like I said, luckily we have guys like Marcus and Tommy and Kyle and Canizero proving himself, you know, scoring three or four goals that game. Uh, it was awesome, and we won at home, so that's good. <laughs> Thanks to the series sweep of Chesapeake, Ohio was now riding a five-game winning streak. I think at that time of the year, we just had a tough one with Boston, had a tough one with Chesapeake. We were realizing that we were winning, but they weren't pretty, and that's good and bad. You know, it's like it's good that we're able to come out and win those, but we knew we had a sizable gap that we had to close in order to get better. The MLL trade deadline arrived on June 27th. The New York Lizards acquired all-star Will Manny and midfielder Joe Lacasio from Boston, two days before the Lizards hosted the machine. At that time, we actually had worked with Boston a long time. You know, we thought Lacasio would be a good fit with us, and it went right up to the trade day, and, and then uh, all of a sudden, you know, we see things aren't going that way, and, and they, they put everything over to, to New York. Rather than debuting as a new gear for Ohio, Lacasio instead threw a cog into the machine. I was a teammate with Joe Lacasio for four years of college. I know where he shoots, I know how he shoots. The ball was coming, I thought I had it, and uh, dude shoots the ball hard. Lacasio shoots, he scores! Count it, and that's a two-pointer! And the Lizards take the lead! The Lacasio goal could have been worse. It could have come from the opposite end of the field, as it did on Independence Day in Denver. Knocked away by Kelly, he'll fling it the length of the field. Oh! That's gonna count! Oh my goodness, I have never seen anything like that in my entire life. Goal of the year! The Machine and the Outlaws had been circling each other at the top of the standings all season. They would finally meet in week 12 in a rematch of last year's MLL championship game. Obviously that one was, was circled on the calendar as, as one to look forward to. I think just because it was so late in the season, um, it was there for sure. Uh, you know, that's the team that beat us in the finals, and, and that's the team that we were neck and neck with in the standings the entire year. I do remember that both teams were kind of missing key players. Ohio was without Marcus Holman in that game. So it was kind of a letdown for that because you're thinking, well, these are the two best teams, but maybe without their best players playing in this game. Six of the last seven meetings between the clubs had been decided by two goals or less. This one would be no different. Once again, the game came down to a pivotal shot in the fourth quarter. We're obviously very aware how good that team is and how well they play together. So in terms of our preparation, you know you have to bring your A game to Denver or they'll expose you. Rookie out of Loyola makes a great move and fires and scores! Romar Dennis! Denver back in front here early fourth quarter. Tough game, a game that you know they, they made more plays than we did. I think that too by Romar really you know, it was tough for us to rebound. I think that stretched the lead to 13 to 10 in the fourth, and you know, we just couldn't get it done. It was a great play by him. You know, it was a phenomenal play. It really was a, a staple play that says, hey, you know, we're gonna win this game. We just couldn't get it done, but I think everybody, again, in our locker room was like, okay, we have them next week. Like, this is this is the long con. Like, you know, we they got us this week, but we're gonna be charged up for, for next week in Denver. The long con involved a short turnaround. The week 13 matchup in Denver followed to form. The machine struggled to gain possession on faceoffs and trailed in the fourth quarter. The elephant in the room with our team was our faceoff percentage the, the entire season. You know, I think we were, we were hovering around 40%. And, uh, you know, we bring Anthony Kelly in for that game. We dressed two faceoff guys to try and, you know, alleviate some of that, and it, it totally backfires. Without faceoff success, Ohio relied on their faceless men one of whom would turn the tide with one play. Well, we had a ride in place and we had everybody in place and, you know, they're so athletic. You know, Denver's so athletic that, you know, we were pressing, we had to get the ball back. And then they get the ball to Jeremy Sieverts, who arguably one of the best athletes in the league. I saw Sieverts running down that righty side. He's coming down this way and I remember yelling at another midi, hurry up and get in, we gotta make a defensive stand. I was running upfield and looking upfield to like try and see if, if there was anybody I could cover. And I was like, I maybe almost threw my head up in despair, like, ah, oh, they, they broke the, the ride. Next thing you know, our guys are looking at me. I just looked at BK. Brian Carolinas, I mean, you could argue, is, is 
the best long stick midi of the past five years in terms of takeaways and, and being able to disrupt uh, the other team's best midfielder. Oh, oh that's a great check wow. by Carol Lunas. with the old. We uh, haven't seen that dead check in a long time. Butt end. Uh oh, the old kayak check right there. All of a sudden, I see everybody start running back this way, and I turn, and BK's picking the ball up and he's throwing it to Brian Cole. Sure enough, it turned right back and gave it to Cole, and Cole gave it to Connor Zero, and, and he stuck it. And now all of a sudden, we're wow. tied. It's a tie game with 3.17 left to go. To have the confidence and the skill to do that with a minute to go with the game on the line, turn it over and lead to a huge goal for us is unbelievable. Seeing the replay after the game, I was like, that is incredible. I watched it maybe 50 times after the game, and for him to throw that check on that stage and for it to propel us to tie the game up and then win it in, in regulation, you know, just an incredible play. When he took that ball away, it's like, and that is why you don't clear the ball around Brian Carolunas. <laughs> Peter Baum would score the game-winning goal with under two minutes left in regulation as the machines split the regular season series with the outlaws. Probably the toughest, grittiest win I've, I've ever been a part of in a game where you win four face-offs. Uh, in a game where you're probably, you know, the time of possession is, is double to almost triple in the other team's favor. And for our defense to stand strong the way that they did. I think it's huge, for sure. And, you know, that's one on one with them for the year. And I think, again, we left that game saying, I think we're probably going to see those guys again. The following week against New York saw the machine accomplish two more goals. They avenged their previous loss to the Lizards and in doing so, secured a spot in the playoffs. I remember speaking pregame to that game, just saying win and we clinch, not only clinch, but good chance we would get the home game. So it was huge for us to really come out there and, and get it because we, we did want to play at home for a playoff game, kind of decide our own fate. That was kind of like the perfect storm, culmination of being pissed off about how we lost to them earlier in the season, gaining confidence from that win in Denver, our final home game, guys just you know being being really hungry. The Ohio machine have clinched another playoff berth and a home playoff game as they'll host a semifinal two weeks from today. Clinching that playoff spot, able to get that win against New York in dominating fashion, to me that was the first time all season that I was convinced that this is a team that was gonna get back to the title game. Despite dropping their final regular season game to Rochester, Ohio was optimistic heading into the postseason. They had the reigning league MVP, a hot goalie, and the league scoring leader, Peter Baum. A couple roll fakes on Mazzori, gets his hands free, he scores! Peter Baum! It's funny, I don't know if I should say this, but I remember Tommy got the uh, MVP trophy and he was saying, why am I getting this? Why isn't Baum getting this? He had an MVP season, you know, Tom got the award, but I, I, Tom would admit that, you know, Pete was just as deserving of it. And, you know, he was the MVP of our team, I, I think, just from top to bottom, from the first game to the last. Ohio would face Florida in the MLL semifinals. It was a different launch team from earlier in the year, led by a promising group of talented rookies. You know, when we started in December on our path together, no one thought we were going to do anything. But as we started to play, a lot of people kind of said, wow, man, these guys play hard, they compete, they're doing some good things. We've already achieved a goal of being successful this year. You know, this, everything else is icing on the cake. They're having fun. They're playing fun lacrosse, which is dangerous. Yeah, you know, I think that's the most dangerous lacrosse. When a group is having fun, uh, they're young, you know, they don't know what they don't know, and uh, they have nothing to lose. So we knew it could be a very dangerous game for us, for sure. What was dangerous was Ohio's confidence. Watching the team that night before the game, though, they were very loose out on the field. You got the sense that they were in control of the situation and that this game against Florida, not that they were taking them for granted, but it was just another step on their way to getting to that championship game. Coming out a little early, moving around, getting reacclimated to the field, and you know, just kind of talking as a team and, and being ready to roll instead of coming out with a minute to go and just bringing it in and starting. And we started doing that after that game in every game. Um, and what I think came of that was just we got to be ready to go in the beginning of quarters. We have to start the game fast, we have to start each quarter fast, and we have to finish. True to their MVP's words, Ohio started the game fast. First offensive possession for the top scoring team in the league, and what a goal to get things started with Tom Schreiber. Started each quarter fast. Paskolgin, he's a GLE, he's at the goal, and he scores! And finished. He'll step into a shot and score, and it's a five goal advantage now for the machine. 
I like comparing it to boxing a little bit. You know, like when you have a veteran boxer against a rookie boxer, you know, the veteran boxer sometimes has to feel out that, that younger boxer in those first couple rounds, and, and you're gonna take some blows, you know, like that's just the way it is. And then if the veteran boxer does what he's supposed to do, he should understand and size some things up a little bit, you know, rounds three, four, or five, and deliver some blows that are going to be tough for that rookie to rebound from. I think we left that game at an ultimate high in terms of confidence. We felt like Florida was, you know, one of the best teams in the league, and, and we knocked them off. So what's better than knocking off a great team before you prepare for the championship game? The semifinal win secured a spot in the championship. For the second year in a row, the machine would face the outlaws for the MLL title. To get to a point where you're in the championship game, I don't care who's on the other side. Like, it, it's about us. It's about our, our team and um, whether or not we're going to rise to the occasion and get it done. That being said, having another opportunity against Denver was icing on the cake. It's the third time we played them, so I think you know it's to the point where we know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what we're doing. It's really. You know, we're gonna fight you guys, you fight us mentality. And we feel like we had the better fighters. In the last, whatever, eight meetings, seven meetings, we're literally like one or two points away from each other. <laughs> That's how identical the two teams, have, at least competitive-wise, have been. And didn't really expect anything less for this championship. For the first time in history, the MLL championship would be played indoors at the Star in Frisco, Texas part of the Dallas Cowboys training facilities. Unlike the 2016 game, nature's elements would not be a factor. I spoke to Jake Steinfeld right at the beginning of the season and I said, awesome move. <laughs> I was like, that's great. I was like, this is exactly what we need. We, we don't want to leave this game up to weather. It's too big of a game. And he, he's like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Climate controlled, you're, you don't have to worry about that aspect of the game. And when we got down there for practice Friday night, like. The lighting was great and the setup was great. The turf was like no other turf we've ever played on. Super ridiculously nice turf. Great crowd, great environment. It, I, it was awesome. Bear Davis likes to use boxing analogies. The blueprint for this fight was simple. Stick and move. Pass in front, Cockerton shoots and scores. Control the pace. Here is Peter Baum, partner in front. Connor Canizero slam dunk from Peter Baum. And they have managed this clock well. And don't get caught with a haymaker. Kyle Burnlore, point blank range, big save, maybe a game changer. They come out, they have a great start in the opening quarter of that game down in Frisco. And you're like, yep, this is the team that I anticipated coming into this championship game. They're going to come out here and they're going to get this job done. But to quote Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until they get hit. Reed Trigger, Kavanaugh, scores! Reed Courier finds the ground ball off the wing, streaking in the offensive end. Zach Courier scores! For Denver with a flag down. Final seconds of the man up. Bucklett, doorstep, he scores! One fake, two fakes, and a goal for Denver. We came out, we scored the first couple goals, and then we knew that they were gonna come back in, in punches, which they did. As halftime arrived, the machine trailed the outlaws seven to six. No one was ready to throw in the towel. I think both teams threw some really solid punches in, in the first half. I think they scored with maybe two seconds left before halftime. Mike Bocklet scored a nice goal on the crease. Going into halftime, we felt good about where we were, you know, some minor adjustments. This was no big deal, no big thing that we were losing the game because we knew we were doing good stuff. Our defense, again, was rock solid, <laughs> played really well. We saw Greg P do a better job at the faceoff X after having really struggling the last time we had played Tommy Kelly and Denver. We were doing some good things. We're just a few plays away. We went in at halftime, and I kind of laughed to our staff. I was like, well, if, if you guys want to feel good about anything, I'll tell you this. Generally, a team leading at half of this game has not won this game. <laughs> So it was an ironic stat, I'm kind of a stat geek. I was like, well, you know, if, if anything's gonna work out in our favor, it might, hopefully it's that stat, if any. History aside, the Outlaws immediately took control in the third quarter. I remember coming out in that third saying, all right, well, the next two goals, we gotta score. And sure enough, they were the ones that canned, I think it was three in a row to start the third. Westberg elevates and scores, charging in to the right of Burnlore. Kavanaugh creates Law, doorstep, shoots and scores. Eric Law, wide open. Feeds Berg, shoots, scores. Quick stick goal, what a connection. Kavanaugh to West Berg, and Denver is on a major roll. Outlaws lead 10-6, it is all Denver in the second half. 
Ohio fell behind by four goals. It was the largest deficit for either team. They get to 10-6, and I remember seeing 10-6 on, on the scoreboard, and I remember thinking, like, there are people in this building that are kind of over this. Like, okay, Denver's repeat champions, like, again, like, whatever, Denver, here we go. Things got a little dicey there when it became 10-6, and guys were kind of starting to yell at each other. Things were kind of falling apart. Four goals in, in, in our game in the MLL is not it's not, it's not horrible. You know, it's like you're, you're still pretty much in striking distance, especially early in the game. Uh, I think five goals, I think that's tough. Five goals starts to get, you're starting to put yourself in a bad situation. Big Swan Center, Kavanaugh passing. Doorstep, Burke scores again! Nope, wave that off. Reese call, no goal this time for West Burke. There was a turning point where we were up against the ropes, and I, I, I love the analogy of boxing, because we were, we were, we were against the ropes, and. When they went in the crease and that, and that goal got called off, that was like the bell ringing, you know, like, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank God the bell rang. You know, now we get to go sit down and regroup. A TV timeout was called. Marcus Holman took the opportunity to address a lack of focus from his teammates. What I saw from our team during probably that 10 minute span out of halftime to then was unlike anything I'd seen the entire season. Guys committing stupid penalties, guys taking you know shots they normally don't take, guys turning the ball over. We were making some dumb plays, you know, maybe a little selfish, maybe not real focused, and I, you know, I think it was uh, Marcus Rally. I remember Marcus Holman coming into the huddle and saying, what's going on here? We got plenty of time left, everything's fine. Bringing the team in and saying that, do you guys feel sorry for yourselves right now? Like, because that's what I sense. I sense guys like kind of like little puppy dog eyed out there, I'm like, We've been here before. Like, why are we acting like this? This is not the team that we have built. Marcus could be reading the dictionary, but the way he's saying it and the way he portrays it is inspiring. I'm not going to feel sorry for myself, and nobody else is here. And I think guys are playing really selfishly right now. And if you want to go down like that, like, I'm not going to let it happen. To make the most of what was left in the third quarter, the machine looked to the league leader in points. We come out. We go, you know, dodge, pass, pass, goal, assisted goal. Peter Baum scores. Baum free, righty crank, scores! Next possession, Peter Baum carries behind, throws a 25-yard skip pass right on the money. Kyle Harrison, bang, scores. Kyle Harrison scores! He's got a goal for Ohio. We come out, Mark Cockerton feed to Peter, bang. Righty crank, here we go! Ohio continuing the comeback tonight. Peter Baum with a long-range bomb. So Peter Baum, again, talking about the crucial element he played on our team, was involved in all three of those goals to be able to get us back into the game. It went from 10-6 to 10-9 going into the fourth. You know, then it's like, okay, this is a ball game. Like, anything can happen now we're in this game. Anything could happen, and did. The least likely, most scrutinized member of the machine scored a goal at the time when his team needed it most. Pascolcia the win, Pascolcia shoots, he scores! And a big goal for Greg Pascolcia. And yes, we are all tied. Greg Pascolcia's goal just came out of nowhere. Mental strength for him to do something like that, I think is super impressive. I, I just remember the, the sideline exploding from there. Just being so happy for that kid who's you know, had, his, had his ups and downs this year and to go in there and score a big goal like that in a composed way. I remember he took his time, kind of waited, then went in and buried it. I'm specifically like telling him in the huddle, like, you know, hit, hit me on the point, I'm, I'm open, because I always think I'm open, and he hasn't scored, so he just like kind of looks over like, nah, I'm good, just goes in and scores. Paskolchin only played against Denver once this season. He went 18% from the faceoff X. That's horrible. He was scoreless in the regular season. He has two goals in the playoffs and has played his best lacrosse at the most critical time. Our guys are very loyal. You know, they wanted to ride with Greg because they knew, you know, there's, that he's going to help us win this game. And uh, for him to get that tying goal and step in and, and bury that shot was awesome. The word awesome is often overused in the realm of sports. But when describing Marcus Holman's fourth quarter performance, that word like his shot, was accurate. And then Marcus said, I don't know what happened to him. I drank some of Michael Jordan's secret stuff or something and just uh, <laughs> took over the game from there. That's scary. That's a scary thing, you know, because uh, 
Because once he, he's feeling it, you know, his, his shot's very deadly. Holman shoots, he scores! Marcus Holman, a long-range rocket. It's Holman who finds it. Free, righty hammer. He scores again for the machine. Final moment, shot clock. Holman is free. Marcus Holman cranks. He scores! Marcus Holman, the long-range hammer. Blisters it past Kelly. Five straight tallies for Ohio. He's a lax rat and he loves to cross and you notice the, the best guys in the league are all lax rats. You know, whether they want to admit it, it they're just a bunch of dudes who, who love the sport, love getting better, love their sticks, love shooting. And it's all that stuff to where, you know, Marcus is a guy who just loves lacrosse more than his competitors. I was glad to be able to be the guy to spark us. You know, if you would have told me I would have scored three straight goals in the fourth quarter, I would have told you that you're a liar, because I've never done that, I don't think, in my entire lacrosse career. To see him be the guy to go lead us to victory and sting three goals in four minutes or whatever it is to, to, win, to win us the championship, it was, was amazing. On the heels of Marcus Holman's natural hat trick in the fourth quarter, the Ohio Machine defeated the Denver Outlaws 17-12 to to win the 2017 MLL Championship. And there it is! For the first time in franchise history, the Ohio Machine has won the Major League Lacrosse Championship. The Machine has motored to the title. All cylinders firing. Ohio has done it. It was another first for Ohio. It was such a back and forth game and then the run we went on happened so quickly and there was so much emotion and energy surrounding it. To kind of see that clock hit zero and just be like, Wow, like this, this is it, it happened, it's done, we did it. And just to get it run together and seeing guys crying and, and jumping up and down, it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. That's what you dream of as a, as a kid. You know, I've, I've had that dream in my mind, um, you know, since I was 12 or 13 years old, being the last team and being able to lift the, the trophy over your, your head. For me, it was, it was pretty happy. Um, you know, I kind of sat back and watched guys run to me and just enjoy the moment. Some guys, you know, they're even getting emotional about this win because people put in a lot of work into this and it's, it's, it's an amazing feat to do. You know, it's, you're playing across at the highest level and you've won a league that is made up of the best players in the world. So it's a huge deal. Being able to hug Tom and, and Dominique Alexander and Jake Bernhardt and Scotty Rogers and Kyle Harrison, like with Scotty, Dominique and Jake, you know, we were there when this team was 2-12, and 12, and we were in the garbage of the league, and, you know, teams came in and walked all over us on our home field, and, you know, to be able to see this through and finish it the way that we did. The 2017 machine followed a blueprint that had been set four years earlier. They've already begun drafting the next one. Coach Davis is always talking about how we've kind of made strides since he took over as a new full-time coach of the machine, make the playoffs, make the playoffs, make the championship game, win the championship game. Now, every year your goal is to get to the championship and win, but I think we, we kind of took a few steps to get there. Every year we've opened up, like the past couple years, of something we've never done. Like, we've opened up at Florida, never won at Florida, won at Florida. You know, had to get in the playoffs, never won in New York. The one in New York, you know, like, and that's, those are things that we talk about and it's a big deal. And, and you know, I think we never won 10 games. You know, it's like we're about to, you know, we're about to win 10 games. You know, we're about to beat Denver in the finals. Guess what's next is, you know, never had to defend uh, a championship. <laughs> that's what's next. <laughs>